All right, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all in person. It's been a year, I guess, since the military working group last met, so it's wonderful to be back in person. Uh, welcome to the May 8th, 2023 military working group meeting. My name is Deputy Mayor Steve Goble from the city of El Cajon, and I'll be kicking off today's meeting. Uh, before I begin, I'd, last, I'd like to ask Tessa, who's serving as our clerk today, if we have a quorum. Thank you, Chair, we do have a quorum for this meeting. Great, thank you, Tessa. Would you all join me and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Great, thank you. Before we begin with our agenda items, I'd like to review the meeting process for both the working group members as well as the members of the public who wish to participate. For working group members, when you'd like to speak, just please raise your hand and I'll call on you by name. And Tessa, can you provide a quick reminder on how the public comments will work? Thank you, Chair. Yes, if you are here in the room and you would like to provide public comments, please fill out a a uh, comment a slip from the back of the room. I believe you can find them at the seventh floor reception desk and bring that slip to me prior to your item being called. Uh, members of the public online, um, just raise your virtual hand during the item that you would like to speak on and you will be called by the name or the phone number that you have entered on Zoom. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we uh, begin, do any members of the working group have any questions before we get to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and proceed. Okay, on to item number one, which is member or public comments. Tessa, do we have any comments from the public or for non-agendized items? There are no public comments on this item. Okay. Uh, do working group members have any comments? that they'd like to make on non-agendized item at this point. Seeing none, we'll go ahead, move on to number two, which is the chair's report. I've got several items to just kind of be informative to you all. Last week, the governor announced a $100 million award, the largest in the state, to SANDAG and to NCTD for the San Diego Bridge Replacement and Double, double Track Project. That's quite a grant. We're really appreciative of that. The Navy has a bridge run, the Navy bridge run scheduled for May 21st, and Sandag will have a booth at this event. The Vanpool program has helped travel demand, needs for military personnel who can also leverage tips incentives. Sandag offers a $500 subsidy, $600 for electric per month, in addition to tips. Sand, uh, Sandag's Vanpool program will run during the month of June, an employee commuter survey will be coming out in the next month or two. Please encourage participation from your commands. Next, to kick off Bike Month, we celebrated the groundbreaking of Border to Bayshore Bikeway last week. This is a seven mile route to connect Imperial Beach, the San Ysidro community, and the busiest international land border crossing in the world. Bike Anywhere Day is May 18th, and more than 100 pit stops have been identified throughout the county. Naval Base Coronado and San Diego have pit stops in addition to the one at the ferry. Next, qualifying U.S. military veterans may enroll in the Sandag Fast Track Veterans Toll Exemption Program to receive free tolls on all California toll roads, bridges, highways, or toll facilities. In the San Diego region, this benefit includes a 100% toll discount on the SR-125 toll road. Next, MCAS Miramar invited Sandag environmental personnel to attend their demonstration for Ethor, an integrated electric semi-autonomous mobile power station. This work directly complements Sandag's electrification goals, including expanding EV charging infrastructure. Next, the California State Department of Housing and Community Development is soliciting input on the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, or RENA, process and ideas for addressing California's housing shortage. The new deadline for this survey is May 12th. The California Defense Leadership Summit is scheduled for May 24th, 25th in Sacramento. This is hosted by ADC and the California Governor's Military Council to recognize and highlight 
critical issues that are common across bases, communities, and workforce that require prompt attention to reinforce defense networks. Just two more, just two more. The DOD Climate Resilience Workshop is scheduled for July 10th through 13th in St. Louis, Missouri. This workshop will allow DOD stakeholders and partners to explore the many facets of climate change, a national security threat that has tangible impacts to military readiness. And finally, uh, there was a question on some of the focus groups about 24-hour childcare for military members. This is a benefit available to the public as well. The YMCA childcare has a 24-hour care program. Uh, it's available to the public as well as military members. And we will be sending out a link to those resources after the meeting. There are 808 24-hour care facilities for childcare in the county, which is great news. Okay, Tessa, do we have any comments on item number two from the public? We have no public comments on this item. Great, thank you. Uh, any working group members have any comments on any of those reports? Anything you'd like to add or? Okay, sounds good. We'll just keep cruising right along. Moving on to the next item, item number three, approval of the meeting minutes. Do we have any public comments on this? Tessa, sorry. There are no public comments on this item. Okay. And I'd like to remind members that even though you may not have been part of the working group from the minutes of May 9th of last year, you can still vote on them. There's no requirement that you needed to attend in order to approve, edit, or comment. Sometimes uh, it's just the fact that you trust that the clerk was accurate in the, uh, there you go. <laughs> we got to have got a high five from our clerk already. You trust that the clerk took good minutes. That's what you're voting on really rather than the content itself. So do I have a motion from any working group member to approve the minutes? So moved. So moved by Mr. Erdison. And do I have a second? Second from Mr. Grooney. All right, all those in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, all those abstain, that's unanimous. All righty, thank you. Cruising, moving on to the next item, item number four, the military working group meeting calendar. We have to choose a couple more dates for the rest of the year. And I think uh, we've got those, the calendar, the dates are September 11th or 25th is one date. And then the next one I believe is in December. Is that December 4th? I don't have that. Let's talk about September for a second while we check on the December date. 9-11 will be the next scheduled meeting. But of course, with the military, we don't know if you all have events or remembrances or other things that might uh, be more important to you on that day. So does anybody have a conflict with September 11th that they'd like to bring up? No? I think we're okay. So we'll go ahead and make that date September 11th for the next working group meeting. And the last one, I think, is December 4th. You'll have to help me with the uh, links in the agenda. Did you know what the December date is? December 4th. December 4th. December 4th. Lucky guess. Thank you. Okay. And let's also please calendar December 4th for the third meeting. Of course, this is as needed. Okay. So we need a motion to approve those dates. Do I have a motion from a member of the group? So moved. So moved by Mr. Erdison, and do we have a second? Who's second? Thank you, by Member Wasowski. All those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed, all those abstaining, that passes unanimously as well. Thank you. Okay, moving on to item number five, military working group feedback. I'd like to take time just to thank all of you who participated in those focus groups. We really wanted to make sure that uh, the content in these meetings is worth your drive downtown San Diego because it is a quite a drive for, for a number of folks. So thank you for taking time to help us make what we hope is a relevant and interesting and actionable agenda for you. So uh, before we get to item five, do we have any uh, comments from the public on that? I do want to state for the record that there were no public comments on item four, and there are none on item five. All right. Thank you. 
And no items, no comments on item five. Thank you. Okay, so staff, uh, April, are you want to present this? Yes. Okay, it's all yours. Thank you, Chair. So I just wanted to say thank you for all of you um, that we've reached out to and we were able to discuss some of our concerns and opportunities with the future military working group agenda items. Um, I just want to say that we heard and we are excited to start um, strategizing with you the agenda items for the upcoming calendar year. As you know, the last military working group meeting was a year ago. So we're hoping that we can bring back the cadence of quarterly meetings by working with you to make sure that all of the agenda items that we present are of relevance to all of you and the local jurisdictions. Um, some of you might remember with the military multimodal access strategy that we did a few years ago, that was a Caltrans planning grant where we all worked together to prioritize projects that uh, supported mission readiness. And I'm hoping that we can take that that work that we did and continue looking for ways to find funding or prioritize or move forward with all the projects that we are all working um, together at the agency level or partnering together um, at the regional level. Um, we did hear that although the updates are helpful, we um, a lot of your time is very important to to you and to us. And so we're trying to keep the the informational items very high level and informative and allow you to read um, the websites prior to or after the meetings. And that way we can keep these um, condensed agenda sessions to as little as um, the, the one and a half hours that we do have. Uh, we did hear also that there are opportunities um, to share that some of you may or not may or may not are aware of. So if you look at the agenda today, we have a discussion of the budget and we also have a discussion of two partnership grants that were awarded in the prior year that um, support mission readiness and um, local jurisdiction projects. So we want you to, to listen to these projects and see if there's any relevance of how um, your agency can apply for these grants and hopefully move forward with other projects that are a priority to you. Um, we also have been closely working with our government relations team because we want to make sure that you are all aware of any state and federal policies that may impact you as your agency or us as a region. So prior to every meeting, um, hi Tate, you can take a seat. <laughs> um, prior to our meetings, we could um, we can discuss uh, some of the some of the policies that you may want to elevate internally. So I'm I'm, I'm working with our government relations on that. Um, additionally, we also have been collaborating with our regional um, planning committee representative to help have a standing role for the military working group to provide feedback to agenda items or recommendations to the board. And I'll have Stacy um, come talk to you a little bit about that too. And then um, I've also been talking to a few of you about different projects that you were awarded funding for, and I'd like to highlight and discuss some of that here. But um, I'll go ahead and um, hand it off to Stacey so she can tell you a little bit more about the military working group's role as it relates to the Regional Planning Committee. Morning, everyone. I'm Stacey Cooper. I'm a senior planner here at Sandag and the RPC staff liaison. Excuse my voice between the Padres game yesterday and a concert on Saturday night. <clears throat> I'm a little bit raspy. Um, so yeah, so the Regional Planning Committee meets every month, the first Friday of every month. We report directly up into the board. Part of our responsibilities are making recommend policy recommendations on regional planning issues, um, helping with the preparation and implementation of the regional plan, and making funding recommendations to the board of directors on different SANDAG grant programs. There are four working groups that report up to RPC. Um, you guys are one of those. And what April and I were talking about is being a little bit more coordinated in our efforts and at our meetings after you guys meet, coming and giving an update to the Regional Planning Committee about stuff that you're working on and what you'd like to be more involved in. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Stacey. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, and then uh, one of the other things that we were talking about is the opportunity for us to network in the region. All of you hold very important roles in each of your agencies, and sometimes we just don't know who to ask. So for example, there was a request for, how do I find out where we can find 24-hour childcare in San Diego? I don't know the answer, I work in transportation, but we were able to work through Rich, who was able to work through his network and find that solution to share with you. So if there are anything, if there are any things that you guys want to know that you just don't know who to ask, this is a great place to collaborate and then a chair and I can work together to find the solution for you too. Um, and then also there's opportunity for all of you to network. So if you guys did um, come here five minutes before the meeting, this is a great team of um, leaders in our community for you guys to work together and use, utilize for your benefit. 
And then also I wanted to, to take the time to allow some of our, our, vote, our member agencies to talk about projects. Um, I was hoping that we can call on um, Sam to provide an, op, um, an update on Harbor Drive in Orange County. Do you wanna to speak to that now or do you wanna wait? Harbor Drive? Uh, the Orange County bike path that oh, you said, yeah. yeah. So good morning. Uh, Caltrans reached out to us, uh, District 11 reached out to us last week, and we met with them to discuss a uh, future bike path. Currently, from Harbor Drive up to Orange County uh, line, they come through the base and then they go on elite licensed area for Caltrans before they hit the state park, San Onofre State Park. Um, the problem that the pub, general public has is one they have to be able to pass security clearance to get a pass and the pass is only good for six months. Plus anytime we have what we call vertical replenishment, which is helicopters moving logistics from the shore to uh, ships off at sea, uh, we have to shut down because we can't have them flying over uh, the public while they have sling load under them. And other than training exercises, we shut down that bike path. So what we're trying to do is see if they can go along the I-5, have a safe transit uh, all the way up to the Orange County line where that would eliminate the need for base security concerns and the public being, if you're a foreigner, you're just not gonna be able to bike that path. And there's no walking allowed on the base, so you can't hike it. So those, that's an opportunity. Uh, they had some alternatives as they have to do as planners. Unfortunately, uh, none of them were feasible from our perspective because it would open up another, I guess, access point to the installation, which would not be acceptable. So hopefully the funding will either cover the entire path or uh, the path from Harbor Drive to Las Bogas and then transition to a phase two from Las Bogas up to Orange County. Uh, the point being is it will connect without going through the base to the licensed area for uh, an easement for Caltrans to use. Um, and then they can use the state park, but ideally they would stay off of both of those and go straight up uh, the coastline. That's about Thank it for you, that. Sam. Uh, so that's another opportunity that we were able to prioritize our, as a region to provide access for our local community to use right of way within our bases. And um, that's just one example of a successful project in our region. Another project that I wanted to highlight is, um, Erica, could you talk a little bit about Palm Avenue? Thank you, April. Um, good morning, Chair and um, working group. Um, so the city of Imperial Beach, I know staff's also bringing up a presentation, the city of Imperial Beach uh, in partnership with uh, San Diego, uh, San Diego, I'm sorry, in October, were awarded a uh, Palm Avenue complete multidol uh, corridor um, active transportation program grant for a total of $23 million. Um, this is a section of uh, Imperial Beach that we relinquished from Caltrans. Um, it does connect to the city of Coronado and obviously you would go through the city of San Diego. So we're, um, uh, and then military as well, obviously. Um, we're ongoing discussions right now to seek some uh, letters of support with those agencies and then partnering as well with any businesses around there and doing a lot of outreach. The draft um, RFP is being proposed, uh, being drafted right now. Um, the total project is $26 million, but really what Essence is, and I asked staff if they can provide this so you can get a visual. Do you have a, the previous slide? I'm sorry. The first one, first slide. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I didn't include it, but um, I wanted to show a rendering of what it looks now. This is Palm Avenue. We don't have those dedicated bike lines. We don't have pedestrian lighting, and we also don't have um, any landscaping. So this is sort of a visual so you can see what we're uh, trying to propose. Next slide. Um, that this adds additional landscaping and shading as well, widens the sidewalks of uh, the Palm Avenue and also a buffer obviously for any of the bike lanes. Next slide. 
And as you can see, there's more um, more landscaping, and then hopefully in the future, we can also improve some of the business corridor as well. And then the last one. So you can see some of the buildings there with the uh, businesses, and then it also activates the um, pedestrians, safe pedestrians. So really, in essence, is it widens the sidewalks, make it more friendly, uh, protect the bike lanes, as, as I mentioned earlier, and then greater landscape. Uh, traffic signals also on the corridors of Palm Avenue. There's like six different intersections. This will not only improve um, make it more safer, but also, you know, for any military personnel that are going also transporting to um, the Coronado or even at home, uh, we also have some bases there. Um, and then um, this is not subject to Caltrans because like I mentioned, we did relinquish, but uh, the city of San Diego did relinquish also part of that road uh, through Caltrans. So we're working in partnership with them as well to make sure that um, together we can, you know, enhance it going all the way to the freeway and um hoping hopefully um this will improve you know any traffic calming features as well so that's the update thank you erica and our representative from oceanside isn't here but i did want to um share that the city of oceanside is updating their general plan to include highlighting projects specifically that support mission readiness and this is was elevated as a result of our military multimodal access strategy and i just thought that was very unique since i haven't seen that in um, other community planning um, plan updates so it's just something i wanted to share and maybe we can hear back from them at the next uh, military working group meeting uh, so I just wanted to uh, bring forth those highlights and let you know that this is an opportunity for us to collaborate regionally, define partnerships, and hopefully uh, apply for grants together. And also, if there's anything that we as a group want to elevate to the Regional Planning Committee, um, we will have a standing agenda item at that meeting. So um, if there's, if you want to bring it up here or if you want to just send us an email, we can work with our chair to include it in the next um, update. Back to you. Okay, thanks, April. Uh, Tessa, just checking in, nobody has any public comment after the presentation? There are no public comments. Thank you. Uh, any questions or discussion from members of the working group? It's just a, a uh, informational item only, discussion only, no action needed. So, Sam, do you have a question or comment? No, I, uh, I'm uh, gonna speak for uh, JJ Gamlin. Uh, he asked me to cover uh, if anybody's not familiar with the readiness and environmental protection and integration program that the Department of Defense has, uh, raise your hand. It's, a, it's basically funding for installations to partner with non-government organizations, environmental groups to maintain open space uh, for the purpose of uh, basically buffer and and uh, counter encroachment for installations. It also funds mitigation. Ken Pendleton, I can speak from our own experience. We use it a lot for off installation mitigation uh, to unencumber uh, the habitat impacts within the Ken Pendleton footprint. Um, we can't train in certain areas because of a species. We will work with the fish and wildlife and NGOs where we share in the cost and eventually the NGOs will run it, uh, but we fund 50% plus the escrow account uh, for maintenance uh, in the future. Uh, recently, the, that particular office, program office, published a guide which uh, reflects other potential uh, complementary funding through US Fish and Wildlife, BUREC for water, and uh, even the Office of Defense Local Community Cooperation, which used to be Office of Economic Adjustment in the past, new acronym longer than usual, but they have different grants also, but one of them is mentioned, which is the Defense Community Infrastructure Pilot Program. It's only on its second year, um, and it does work for funding shovel-ready. If you can link that project, to an installation and how it supports that installation. Quality of life, resiliency, readiness. Uh, we uh, assisted Oceanside in, in receiving a grant of 3.5 million for their fire station one 
Uh, that fire station did support the installation during wildfire season by backfilling our um, housing area fire station that allows us to deploy uh, our assets in more into the brush uh, to fight wildfires. And so I'm not an expert on it, but I'd be happy to take your questions and, and get you connected with the right people if you have that. And uh, just one more comment. I think I went off on a tangent with you because I had two Caltrans issues. One is the bike path, which I mentioned, I won't dwell on that. The other one is anything that can be done to our entrance there at Harbor Drive. Um, it is not anything that Caltrans predicted, nor did we. As our security requirements increase, we have to basically search vehicles and that sometimes presents an unsafe condition where our traffic backs up into the 76 on-ramp to the I-5 North. And of course you have cars merging to get off uh, both on Harbor Drive uh, West and, and into the installation. Those could be problematic during times when we have to ramp up security. And um, that is something that hopefully will be planned out in the future to, to be able to assist some kind of traffic relief from there. We can't back the gate any further than we've done. And, uh, and really, even if we did, the measures continue to be the same. That's all, thanks. Well, thanks for the heads up. I mean, every time there is an unusual event, the public certainly appreciates having as much advance notice as they can to make adjustments or detours or things. So uh, that would be a great thing to know when it happens. Thanks. I've got a couple items, I think, on the agenda that didn't make it on mine. Uh, Ms. Friend, do you have some comments you'd like to talk about on uh, related to the bridge and things going on in Coronado, mental health, things like that? Um, you know, I... I... Well, I, I can comment on that, but I also wanted to comment on this agenda item. We're still on number five. Sure. Okay. This is, this is kind okay. of a terrific open okay. open item. Great. Well, I, I want to say I really appreciated uh, the meetings that um, Ms. De Jesus you held with the different groups. I know that Coronado participated with the city of Imperial Beach. We we're able to share some of our feedback, but I was curious about what you heard more broad based from everyone. Since um, perhaps I missed it, and I apologize if I did. Just getting a, a greater summary of what other partners in this group wanted to see from these meetings going forward and some more, maybe more tangible recommendations for how we might work together and talk about things. So are, is that going to happen? Is that in process? Did I just miss that step? Yeah, I just left it at a high level with my okay. discussion here, but what I'll do is um, I'll attach a summary to the meeting minutes so that you can hear the discussion that happened in each of those um, breakouts because um, a lot of what I heard was this is the opportunity for us to talk about priority projects, issues of concern and challenges uh, adjacent to military bases and hopefully work together to find funding. And so the budget and grants is something that is really important to everybody attending and that's why that is the bulk of our agenda for today. Um, and then also there, the opportunity for us to collaborate and share lessons learned. So the, a, lot of, a lot of the grants, like the two OLDCC grants that were awarded are an annual um, annually awarded and we've uh, we had one at Sandag and we had one in National City so far and a lot of the other jurisdictions can also benefit from that that funding because it, it is coming out on an annual basis and then we're also working with our with Muska and Sam on identifying what other federal grant opportunities are there because um, Sandag we track the ones that we can apply for that are a uh, uh, a priority for our regional plan update, but we can't apply for everything. So we're hoping to use this forum to share some of those opportunities. And at least if, if we can't lead the grant application, some of you in your jurisdictions can. And then also just providing updates in general about projects of significance that would um, would benefit the, the advisory members. So that's it at a high, at a high level, but what I'll do is I'll, I'll send the summary bullet points of um, specific projects that were shared. All right, thank you, that's so helpful. And if I might make a suggestion, now that we've adopted our calendar for the year, maybe we could group out topics around those meetings so we know as members what we're gonna be talking about in September and December, and maybe there's a commonality of issues. Like we can, if, if today is the focusing on budgeting and funding and grants, maybe next one could be some other issue that was a priority for all the members interviewed. And I think that would be really useful. And it would also personally help me just to kind of think and plan and be prepared to really participate, so. 
That's great. I look forward to it. Um, and then to the question of how things are going in Coronado, uh, well, we are, things are busy. We have a third carrier and I, Nan is here. Yeah, we have a third carrier and we have been feeling it a lot. Um, having a third carrier in port and that started about two weeks ago means that we've got three fully staff, not with all the air wings, but uh, carriers and a lot of traffic coming over the bridge. So I can say that my employees at the city of Coronado have been really feeling it terribly from about 6.30 to I'd say about 7.30 or 8. So it's something that we're pay really paying a lot of attention to and it has really um, affected transportation coming onto the island for sure. So that's what's happening. Um, otherwise, we are you know, gearing up for the summer season. We're seeing more, more visitors in general to the island. Um, but, it, but pertaining to this group, that's a major event that we're seeing is just the impacts of that third carrier. Thank you. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Lieutenant Wasowski, you might have some words on serving local communities. Was that? I hope I'm not putting you on the spot. It's on my 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 version of the agenda. But if it's not, you can just say, you know, I. No, really, it is um, because unlike uh, our DoD counterparts, one of the big things we do is we do serve the communities. We are out there performing the missions every day, search and rescue. Um, we openly engage with a lot of our community partners. Um, so my only question during the focus group was, how can we serve you guys better? Um, I know that with um, the repeal of Title 42 coming up, we are going to be uh, very heavily engaged with uh, potential uh, mass migrant events in, on the water side. So we're probably going to start to get pretty um, inundated with uh, lack of assets pretty pretty shortly here. So, but as far as serving the pink is search and rescue, whatever we can do to help you guys better. We're here for you. And you're thinking that could be this week. May, I think I've heard May 11th, the end of Title 42, and we may see a, a surge of activity at the border. Yes, we've been look, working really closely with the fire department and with our lifeguard partners as far as coming up with a cohesive plan of action, especially with uh, streamlined communications. Uh, we are expecting to have mass swimmer events, okay. uh, which obviously for us primarily search and rescue. Okay. A lot of those folks don't know how to swim. And, and do you need any help or, or coordination with any cities, uh, uh, first responder agencies or, or things like that? No, we have, uh, we've been doing a lot of drills and exercises and actual mass swimmer events uh, since October of 2021. Um, we've been able to hammer out a lot of really great details and it's definitely something that's been on the forefront of my CEO's minds. Uh, we've, I've had email correspondence with him this week. Uh, we just have a really strong relationship. It's, we have a plan, we have the ability, we have the capability, and everybody has a heightened response posture at this point. Okay, good to know, thank you. Uh, Muska, do you have some comments about the growth of the military and the Navy? And um, Let me first introduce myself. Um, my name is Muska Like. I'm the Deputy Regional Community Plans and Liaison Officer. Um, today marks exactly a month since I've been in this position, and currently I'm also filling in um, for the Regional Community Plans and Liaison Officer, uh, Steve Chung. Many of you have worked with him before. Um, so let me talk a little bit what we do at the region level. Um, we manage the encroachment program for Navy Region Southwest and ensure mission sustainment uh, and coordinate with uh, various stakeholders at local and state level um, to make sure that uh, our bases are able to train and operate um, without uh, any um, major encroachment issues. And then also we um, have a lot of open dialogue with local jurisdictions uh, to address mutually uh, areas of concern and opportunities. We share information, we educate um, the community on the importance of Navy mission. Um, so the Navy Region Southwest team also coordinates internally with our installation community plans and liaison officers. Um, I have Yashi and Anna today here. Um, and the goal is to provide our bases the support that they need and coordinate the regional level efforts. Um, and then at the same time, uh, make sure that they have everything from the region that they need to continue their operations. Um, we also provide policy guidance, um, training, and set the strategic vision uh, pertaining to the encroachment program. Um, so as far as growth projections goes, um, I don't have um, an update for you today, but I will provide you that information um, our next meeting. Thank you. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Any other comments from members about their areas of jurisdiction or things? Okay, informational item only. Yes. Sorry, I just, uh, Mosca reminded me to add something. We do have a representative up at Sacramento. So we're fully engaged up there. So does the Navy, but based on Region 9, DOD, DOD Region 9, which they represent the Department of Defense. Um, and our representative up there are working, currently we're working very closely with the CEC uh, with regard to um, microgrid potentiality. We have some have been displayed here at uh, Miramar. At Camp Pendleton is a different animal because uh, Miramar is just one of the camps that we have in size within Camp Pendleton. We have 18 of them. So we're working towards uh, some future program uh, with them. There's a third party that has to be involved, so I can't talk more about it, but uh, we're, we're looking forward to that grant in the future here, in the next year or so, hopefully. Thanks. Good information, thank you. Uh, Ms. French, your point about knowing kind of what the topic might be so you can prepare in advance, that's an excellent feedback item because we want to know what the military's questions are about Sandag's plans. If Sandag is planning these big five moves and things and, and trying to uh, change the way people move around the county and change the way the people are housed around the county, we want to know how those plans impact you and what questions you would have that could go back up the pipeline to the board of directors to say, okay, the military, this is a blind, I use the word blind spot. I like to avoid blind spots. And so I'll, I'll listen to anybody to say, I might have a blind spot in the area. We want the board to know that there are no blind spots when it comes to the military. So if you have a concern or a question, definitely that would be an example of an agenda item that should drive the agenda rather than, than top down. So uh, between now and September, as you kind of hear about the budget and the projects, as you have questions, please feel free to reach out to either April or myself so that we can agendize those items, prepare for them in the way that we think would be helpful or questions and go forward. I think that will make a more effective and, and meaningful time together as we think about things that affect our areas of influence specifically. So good comments, thank you. Okay, let's go on to item number six, which is the Sandag draft budget. Uh, each year, the Sandag Board of Directors uh, prepares a budget, and it's anticipated that this Friday, the budget will be adopted at the Board of Directors meeting. Uh, we're gonna take a moment to hear a high-level overview of the budget from Julian, our senior budget analyst from uh, Sandag, and April also will be spending some time. So Julian, I will toss it over to you, and what do we need to know? All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for introducing me. Uh, so yeah, I'm Julian Pogreszewski. I'm the Senior Program Budget Analyst for SANDAG and just gonna provide an overview of the draft budget uh, that was uh, that was approved by the board and back in March. Um, we are actually presenting our proposed final this uh, coming Friday, uh, but I just wanna go over the draft for now since the other one has not been seen yet. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, SANDAG uh, puts together the annual budget starting with projects and programs required by our mandates and responsibilities and something that differentiates SANDAG from other counties and uh, cities is we actually budget everything by project rather than uh, by department. And these are just some of our federal and state uh, and local uh, policies and guidelines and mandates that we have to follow and abide by. Uh, next slide. Um, so I'm gonna provide a high level overview of the budget. It has three main categories. It's our overall work program, our regional operations and services, and our capital budget. Uh, next slide. So our overall but, uh, projected budget for FY24 is $1.2 billion. Uh, and as you can see from the chart, our capital projects take over just about half of our entire budget. Um, of our uh, budget, we have 448 million in our Transnet funds, which come from our, our local half cent sales tax. And of that amount, $237.5 million, which is roughly 20%, is actually passed through directly to our local jurisdictions. Uh, next slide. 
uh, as I mentioned before, there are uh, project or budget has three main categories, our overall work program, our capital and our regional operations. So this is just kind of a pie chart of how those three main categories are uh, funded, which is over half of it's funded by federal funds, a good portion of state funds as well. We get a lot of support with uh, grants and those kind of opportunities. Uh, next slide. So the first category is our overall work program, um, which is an inventory of regional planning projects and programs that will be undertaken during the fiscal year. Uh, some examples can uh, are our regional plan and data and modeling services. Um, and our overall work program includes funds from our local state and federal funding sources. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, for our 24 budget, um, we're projected to, for our overall work program, $96.4 million of a total of 60 uh, projects within this category. Um, we have our four main categories and within this section is our regional planning, project implementation, data and analytics, and community engagement and financial management. Um, and next is gonna be our capital budgets. Um, so this capital budget is the largest component of our SANDAG uh, program budget, and it's a direct result of state legislation that made SANDAG the responsible uh, agency for construction of major regional transnet facilities. Next slide. Uh, so this, our capital budget is comprised of 121 total programs or projects and uh, projected for 58.2 or 582.7 million dollars for just FY24. The total multi-year uh, projected budget for our capital projects is roughly around $9 billion. Um, and a list of our some uh, projects that are beginning construction, FY24, uh, list of above Inland Rail Trail, uh, Derby Bikeway, Eastern Hillcrest Bikeway, Orange University Robinson Bikeways, and Del Mar Bluff Stabilization, Phase 5. Um, so we have a bunch of things actually, you know, hitting ground and starting in FY24. So exciting news for that. Um, and then the next is gonna be our regional operations and services budget. And this component of the budget provides management of ongoing operational programs and customer services that deliver enhanced mobility and public uh, safety services provides maintenance and support of intelligent transportation, regional law enforcement data systems that support travelers and public safety agencies in San Diego region. So this can be samples like the uh, SR-125 toll roads, um, freeway service patrol, and the Sandag van pull program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is our regional operation service budget of $71.6 million. Um, it, Sorry. As I mentioned before, it comprises the SR-125 toll facilities, the I-15 fast track manage lanes, our freeway service patrol. Also in this section is our Argus uh, and criminal justice related programs and services. Um, uh, now I will pass it over to April who will highlight the programs and projects related to the military uh, installations. Thank you, Jillian. Uh, for that high-level overview of the budget. I don't know if any of you have already read the Sandag budget. It's about two to three inches thick. So we're hoping that this high-level summary will kind of give you an idea of how our budget is structured and how you could use the book to find opportunities to leverage the funding we already have planned to support some of the projects that you have. So if you're looking for match funding in a grant and we have a project that's in that same area and there's opportunity to align uh, that scope of work with another project in your jurisdiction, that's an opportunity for you guys to look into the budget and see um, what projects we can leverage. And then also, uh, Julian mentioned that there are three specific sections that you guys want to look at. So uh, Sandeg works on several different projects the, during the planning phase. Um, 
if you look at the, the OWP section, basically highlights a lot of the planning efforts. So all of the studies that we do that help us get to that next phase of design and environmental, that's in the OWP section. So if you have a study that you're interested in or you, you don't know that you're interested in, that's the section of the budget you wanna look at. And the next part that you wanna look at is the, the capital section of the budget. And that's where we find the funding for infrastructure projects in our region. So if you're looking at what is, what is Sandeg planning to build, that's the part of the budget you want to look at. And then he mentioned the, the operations section of the budget. And that's where you're going to see programs like the Vanpool program. So one of the things that we find of value is uh, military is probably the highest number of usage in our TDM program for the Vanpool program, and that's supported in that section of the budget. So um, as our chair mentioned earlier today, we provide additional subsidies in addition to the TIPS program, which is why basically it makes the commute free for our military service members who are participants in the Vanpool program. Um, so if there are certain projects that you see that we either discuss or don't discuss, um, that's an opportunity for you to provide feedback that the Vanpool program is really important. We want to we want to maintain that section or that budget in the upcoming fiscal year. That, that's the type of feedback we want to hear. And also uh, just to highlight some additional projects that you may or may not be aware of in the in the budget, we have Otay Mesa East, which is a port of entry that includes um, toll, tolling facilities that use technologies that also support commercial facilities through our border. We have a, one of the busiest borders in the nation, and that's um, that's a high level project. Or another one is Delmar Bluffs um, to support Losan. That's a very important corridor for transportation of both people and goods for our region. Also, I wanted to highlight the um, electric vehicle charging and charging and um, wireless charging initiatives that Sandag's working on both at the Sandag, both from the local jurisdiction perspective, but we're also working with military bases on this effort. Another one is the CMCP. So the comprehensive multimodal planning Plan, quarter plans um, is a project that we work on at the staff level to identify priority projects along these um, high level corridors. And the reason why you want to learn about that is that's um, any project that's identified in those CMCPs is more likely to qualify for funding um, such as SB1 funding. So whether or not you've been able to read through our CMCPs, it's really important to stay informed because if there is a project that you want included on that list, you want to let our staff members know to make sure that we incorporate it as part of um, your priority initiatives. And that, um, I'll pass it back to the chair. All right, thanks, April. <clears throat> uh, before we get into discussion among the group itself, Tester, we have any comments from the public? There are no public comments. Okay. Uh, do any of the members of the group have any questions or comments about some of the items either on the budget or, or not on the budget? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Frank Urtas, and I'm with the Port of San Diego, represent the city of Coronado. Um, I'm interested in, at the Port of San Diego, we have a lot of efforts underway with the electrification of vehicles, the charging of uh, putting the charging infrastructure in for boats that are, or ships that are coming in and out of the Port of San Diego. Um, and there's a great deal of the big effort on our part also to uh, make sure that we're electrifying as many of the vehicles and equipment that's being used at our marine terminals. My question really is what is, um, I'd be interested in, it doesn't have to be today, but in the future and an, an update on what Sandag is doing on that front. I mean, we're all in the same boat, so to speak, of having to change the way that we are handling transportation and what have you. And so I'd be interested in, to see what Sandag is doing, what it's funding uh, on that front. Good question. I, I'd be interested as well. Uh, the, CARB came out with some new uh, regulations, I think just a week ago about the commercial side of things. Uh, I think uh, something that I've been keying in on uh, is the weight of the vehicles that become electrified. And uh, we in El Cajon, we spent uh, last week filling 550 potholes in a week. Uh, it was everybody, accounting, parks and rec, finance, HR, everybody went out to the streets to tamp down cold patch asphalt. And we filled more in a week than we did in the prior 52 weeks combined. But the issue is the heavier trucks cause more damage on our streets. That's for all of our locations all of our streets. 
because, a, for instance, a trash truck, <clears throat> once it becomes electrified, will add five to 8,000 pounds related to the electrification of a truck versus mm -hmm. uh, renewable natural gas. Well, if you look on some streets, you can see a channel where the tires have ridden, and that's where during a rain water puddles, and that's what becomes a pothole of the weakest part. So what is, I think we need to include the cost of electrification in our street maintenance or our road maintenance across because uh, even commercial freight trucks, if they are an extra 5,000 pounds related to electrification, and if the highway administration is limiting the weight of commercial freeways on a highway, for instance, then you, you can have five to 8,000 pounds less of cargo. And that means the cost per unit of what's in the cargo goes up. So there are additional costs with electrification we need to, to get a lot more information on. And I, I agree with your request. Any other comments? Uh, Jeff. From Sandeg. I'm real quick. I'm, I'm from the climate team. I'm working um, on some electrification efforts at Sandeg. I'd be happy to come back to provide a, a full report or a, a presentation on our efforts. We're working on a blueprint with the Port of San Diego to address the transition of trucks and buses region wide. Um, so, I'd be very happy to come back and provide more information at a future date. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Any other questions or comments about uh, the items on this agenda item? Seeing none, we'll move on to item six. Item seven, that is the military installation resilience phase two, the Office of Local Defense Community Corporations, a grant program that provides assistance for projects and programs that benefit both civilian and Department of Defense interests. The military installation resilience project is a continuation of the initial grant SANDAG received in 2021. And we're now gonna hear an overview of this program from Jeff Hoyas, Senior Regional Planner. Jeff. Thank you. And good morning. I uh, should have just stayed up here. Uh, <laughs> my name is Jeff. I'm a, a senior planner here on the climate team. I'm housed within the planning department at Sandag, and I'm here to provide an update on the military installation resilience project. I'll talk a little bit about phase one and phase two. Here's the agenda for today. Uh, give you some background about the grant, where it came from, what we did in phase one. Talk a little bit about what we're doing in phase or did in phase two, and the deliverables that came out of that, and the next steps we identified. So try to keep it nice and short and sweet, but happy to. Uh, and dive in deeper on any one of these three areas that uh, we'll talk about. There's there's really three areas that we're going to be talking about. It's data sharing, <laughs> infrastructure, and uh, mitigation or transportation um, re reduction. So uh, I'll, I'll dive in into that a little bit here. But to, to start off, I want to say that this you know this grant is funded through the Department of Defense's Office of Local Defense and Community Cooperation. Uh, this is uh, the phase two, as I mentioned, but uh, we were awarded a phase one grant a couple years ago, and the, both grants are looking at supporting mission readiness for the Navy installations that surround the San Diego Bay, including Coronado Point Loma and San Diego. We addressed the resilience of the corridors that serve these installations, and we're developing processes and protocols to share that data between San Diego and the Navy so we can do better as we plan region-wide for travel be between the, the Navy installations as well as throughout the region. Um, and so the assessment of the resilience of the corridors here kind of goes back to that infrastructure and transportation, sustainable transportation section there. I'll touch on, on that a little bit here, but I want to talk about phase one study area first. Um, as you can see here, we addressed uh, a, a number of corridors that served the, the Navy installations that surround the bay. Uh, we're, we're looking at primarily the effects of sea level rise to these corridors so uh, and, and increased flooding. So we're looking at the climate uh, impacts uh, and sea level rise associated with that to the to these corridors and uh, trying to understand where there are um, vulnerabilities or areas where the corridors can be improved upon to be more resilient long term. Uh, overall, the, the focus of phase one was to really assess the vulnerability of those corridors, understand some of the adaptation strategies, whether or not those are nature-based solutions or traditional civil, civil engineering solutions. We're also looking to understand um, and, and do some better data sharing between SANDAG and the Navy, as I mentioned, but also with uh, the local jurisdictions that surround the Navy installations and how we can work together to collaborate on projects to address resiliency of these corridors. Um, and we did some engagement with our stakeholders, held um, project development meetings, and really walked through this. And all of the, the, the phase one report findings can be found in the link here in the PowerPoint. 
building off of phase one, we narrowed it down to three different corridors, SR-75 and the 282, Harbor Drive and Pacific Coast Highway. And these were found at most risk or the most vulnerable to sea level rise and flooding impacts uh, due to climate change. And so we, we, we took a deeper dive into these three corridors in phase two. And what we're doing here is, as I mentioned, we're really looking at three things. We're looking at data sharing between SANDAG and the Navy and data between the local jurisdictions in the Navy, as well as with SANDAG. We're looking at climate resiliency of those corridors. So the resiliency, um, the, the actual infrastructure resiliency, and, so, um, and then also mitigation strategies for these corridors. So really the, the data part really touches back to what, what data exists, how can we coordinate better on this data? The resiliency part is looking at are there solutions that are either nature-based or civil engineering projects that can be implemented along these corridors to support the resiliency of the corridors. And then the mitigation element here is sustainable transportation strategies. How can we improve transportation flows throughout the corridors um, by providing alternate choices for transportation? So for data here, we, uh, we have three different bullets here that I'll, I'll kind of touch on, touch on briefly. As I mentioned, the data sharing between SANDAG and the Navy helps inform SANDAG understanding of, uh, of the regional transportation flows. And so we work, we work with, the, with the Navy to understand how we can go through a validation process for our data assumptions that go into our activity-based model. Um, because, you know, we, we're looking you know, within a subsection of the region, but the, there are military personnel that travel throughout the region and, and with outside of the region to the, the Navy here. So we want to make sure that we're understanding how those travel flows really affect, affect regional planning and how, what we can do in the future. And that informs our transportation options and the kind of it all, it all snowballs into uh, the resilient uh, infrastructure part here. And so we also looked at developing a, an inventory of climate data, infrastructure and flooding data, as well as land use and planning data. So we looked at the existing plans that surround the Navy installations to understand what's being planned, what has been implemented, and what, um, what are the challenges still to uh, implementing resiliency along the corridors. And we rolled that into a military installation resilience hub which is for our local jurisdiction practitioners um, to work together to identify potential solutions along those corridors. It's really meant to be serve as a resource so you can identify where the data is, uh, what, what are, where are the critical locations or the areas at most risk, and what are some potential solutions along those corridors so we can roll that in and take the next step to identify funding and pursue these, these projects. And so that rolls in here to the resilient infrastructure element. This is the, the methodology, uh, the simplified methodology of how we identified resilient or, excuse me, critical locations in the corridors and how to make them more resilient. First up was that data review, understanding what, what is going on. And then second, we developed a, a menu or some guides for resilient infrastructure solutions, whether or not those are nature-based solutions, kind of, uh, for example, eelgrass or, or oyster bays, maybe uh, widening beaches so that there is more sand and less uh, wave attenuation, or potentially looking at civil engineering projects that you may be more familiar with, like uh, raised roads, levees, groins, um, more that hardscape gray engineering. And we tried to understand where each has its own place in, to be used. What are the benefits of nature-based solutions versus civil engineering solutions? And at what time would you need to be implementing them? At, at how much uh, potential benefits do they provide? Are there any co-benefits for nature-based solutions like uh, greenhouse gas emissions re reduction or, or other uh, co-benefits? We then identified critical areas and action points. These are essentially the, lo the low-lying areas of the corridors, the areas that are going to be more susceptible to sea level rise or to potential flood drain backups. Um, and then we developed corridor timeframes that really help us understand when to start planning, when to start implementing, and, and then how to address that once the, the sea level rise continues. So this next slide here uh, shows a little bit of that uh, methodology in play. So. The, and the, on the map there, the, the circles are the critical locations, and we identified 12 throughout the three corridors. And these critical locations are the, the low-lying areas in, in the corridors that will, will need at some point in the future some sort of reinforcement via either nature-based solutions or civil engineering projects to ensure that they are resilient to sea level rise and flooding on these corridors. Our, our proposed methodology to address these is through this uh, level one, level two, and level three project phased approach. So um, looking at the, the, the critical locations, you wanna start planning seven to 10 years before the need or the projected need. And then as we look at one foot below, uh, one foot below the, the elevation of that, that road or that corridor, that's when we're, we're thinking about nature-based solutions being the best bang for your buck, so to speak. 
Uh, as you get to a foot above sea level rise, excuse me, a foot above that corridor, it's a combination of infrastructure, civil engineering infrastructure and nature-based solutions. And then as you look long-term at that, that two feet and above, you're really looking at those more traditional grayscape civil engineering projects. The reason why we're not just recommending a project that addresses the third bullet right away is because there is some uncertainty with sea level rise, how fast it's going to be happening, to what extent it will be happening. And there is some good uh, literature out there that shows that nature-based solutions can really help reduce that, those needs long-term. And, and they're also generally cheaper um, and, and easier to maintain than a, a, a traditional civil engineering project. So by phasing these uh, approaches, you have um, a little bit of, of benefits long-term. You're more likely to be able to buy, get buy-in from the stakeholders across the, 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 the area. And, um, and and so we really worked with our local governments. We worked with uh, the, the surrounding local governments, the Port of San Diego, uh, the airport, and and of course our, our military partners in the, in the area to understand what projects may have appetite, what projects don't have appetite, why they may not have appetite. Um, and these are all documented within the framework report that was included in your agenda packet. Um, so that that's the the resilient infrastructure section of the report. This next section here is a sustainable transportation strategies. And this is really uh, meant to provide options for transportation throughout the, this, the study area. We looked at three different areas, active transportation, transit, and transportation demand management. Um, you, some of you all may be familiar with Sandeg's previously known iCommute program. This is the rebranded title of that, Sustainable Transportation Strategies. So iCommute really is meant to share uh, alternative ways to, to get around the region. Um, you heard about the, uh, the, the, excuse me, the, 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 the shuttle on-demand service earlier, um, that's not the name of it, the, uh, the uh, van pool service, excuse me, uh, earlier, and that's part of this iCommute or Sustainable Transportation Strategies program. Uh, but we looked at, at, at as, a, as a project development team at these alternatives to just regular transportation for a couple of reasons. One is you are, if you're reducing the amount of single occupancy vehicles on the roads and in these areas, you're increasing uh, or, or, or reducing congestion, increasing vehicle speeds and flows and making it easier to get to and from the bases. You're also reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, that are being emitted. And so you're playing a larger part of that regional air quality improvement as well as greenhouse gas emission mitigation. So to combine these strategies help provide alternative options reduce and, and benefits as far as air pollution go. The, uh, we did a sim something similar with this, with the, with the group. We identified potential strategies and projects that could be implemented and then got buy-in on whether or not they were actually feasible based on different uh, base uh, priorities and, and commanding officer priorities, as well as the surrounding communities and whether or not they were compatible uh, with land uses. And uh, we developed a VMT reduction toolkit, which ident identifies a suite of options. Some of them may not be implementable at this time. Some of them may need to be built consensus on. Uh, um, some have more uh, appetite than others. But overall, this provides a, a foundation of options for strategies that the folks can implement uh, in, in the area and surrounding the area. Along all three, data, resilient infrastructure, and the sustainable strategies or sustainable transportation strategies, there are uh, there's a theme of continued next steps that are needed. Uh, for data, we need to continue to work with the Navy to understand the data sharing process between Sandag and the Navy so that we can inform our travel uh, behavior model. Um, and we're gonna be looking at doing that for our next regional plan here. So our regional plan update in 2025 we will, uh, for sustainable, excuse me, resilient infrastructure, we're gonna need to do the same thing, but really what we need to do on that side is get the consensus and the stakeholder buy-in for these projects. We didn't uh, assign any of these projects to be, I mean, these, these are not assignments. These are potential solutions that need to be bought in by the stakeholders and need to be really uh, compatible with the surrounding land uses that are being, um, or excuse me, for the projects that are being recommended. And then once, Consensus is built, then you can look at uh, costs and identify funding and really pursue those and implement those projects. Similarly, with the sustainable transportation options, you're looking at building consensus on which programs or projects may work best for the Navy installations, uh, what, what can work well with the surrounding land uses, and then identify funding and implement those projects. So as a next step, we'll be looking to identify and work with the stakeholders to build the momentum off of what we have already. We don't want this to just be a project that lands on a shelf, but how can we continue this momentum and look to build consensus on some of these projects and work towards our more resilient, resilient corridors into the future? So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Before we uh, get on to any member comments, do we have any comments from the public request to speak? There are no public comments on this item. Okay, uh, working group members, any questions or comments? 
Yes, Ms. Friend. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Uh, There's a lot to cover and a lot of work too. So what I was wondering is uh, we have Sandag and then we've got the coastal cities, Coronado, Imperial Beach, San Diego, at least, who I sure ha I'm sure have their own body of climate work. I know we do. We have a vulnerability assessment. I know that we did some coordination with, with you. Yep. Um, so what I'm wondering is, are we trying to harmonize all of the science and all of our data, knowing that we probably had different consultant teams, maybe different data sets we drew from? Are we working to harmonize that and to have an agreement around what we're seeing around the entire Bay Area and also to have the same terminology? Like I just saw that some of your metrics about we're looking at one foot above sea level rise may not be exactly how we in Coronado are looking at it. So I'm thinking there'd be a benefit because I don't know how to translate what you're saying with what I know from our study. So I'm wondering um, if there's a way that we're working to find a common language and understanding as we're developing strategies together. It's a good question. And a little bit of a nuanced answer, I guess. Um, the uh, yes and no. So there are some, we are working to identify common de definitions and work towards common solutions. However, everybody and different priorities at different agencies may have different desires for certain thresholds of or, or tolerance to sea level rise. Uh, for example, um, through this project, we, use a, I used, we used a more conservative approach as far as our, our risk tolerance because we're working with the, the, the Navy and we were um, we had a conversation of, you know, what is our, our threshold for, for tolerance? Are we looking at a more conservative, a moderate, or, a, you know, a more optimistic approach? And really with the conversation with the Navy, we're looking at a little bit more of a conservative, moderate to conservative approach. And so you may see throughout jurisdictions have a different understanding of where their tolerances or their, their risk tolerances lie. Now, that being said, the purpose of this project and the, the military installation resilience hub that I had identified or mentioned is meant to help build collaboration and consensus around those projects so that you can bring your priorities from your jurisdiction and work with, say, the Port of San Diego, for example, to identify common priorities and then how you can uh, leverage those priorities towards funding and um, implement those projects that benefit both your jurisdictions. Thank you. Just a quick follow up on that. So you also mentioned the port, which I'm glad you did because I'm, excuse me, Mr. Tassin, I left that out. Um, that really matters too. So do we have a good staff team working together across all these agencies that are focused on this? Yeah, I, I've been doing this for uh, seven years here at Sandag and I've built some good relationship with staff at the, the Port of San Diego and throughout the jurisdictions. Um, and the so there, there's Sandag staff working on this as well as building a stakeholder group of sustainability staff between those jurisdictions. Um, Sandag has a sustainability stack, stakeholder staff that looks at all things climate. Uh, and we also have the Accelerate to Zero Emissions, which, which is an electric vehicle collaboration, which ties in all of the, the member agencies and their their staff level folks. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we have discussions frequently about projects and, and grants that we can pursue and um, bringing this military installation resilience thing to that was part of that and kind of buying, getting buy-in from the sustainability staff was, was definitely part of the, the project. And is there a final question? Is there an intersection with the shoreline working group as well? Because I know we have some council members on that. So are they wrapped in these conversations? Uh, we we haven't gone to shoreline specifically with this project, but we do. I work closely with the environmental team who does the shoreline work here at Sandag and Part of that is the nature-based solutions, right? So that, that shoreline element, the beach sand renourishment is a huge part. And so we worked with the, the shoreline team and the env environmental team here internally with SAP here to understand kind of what those pro projects are, what the priorities were, benefits, lessons learned, things we could have done better um, and tr tie that into this project here. But that will definitely be, this will be something that needs to get tied into like the CMCP work that April mentioned earlier, uh, back into the shoreline works and efforts. Um, and so this is not uh, the end all be all, but more recommendations that get built into the larger SANDAG planning documents, our regional plan and, and CMCP work so that that can inform future projects and uh, funding. Great, thank you. Thank you. Good questions. <laughs> Yes. Um, first of all, I want to thank the SANDAC team for working with the Navy very closely on this plan. Um, this is a great example of collaboration and partnership between Navy, SANDAC, and uh, local agencies uh, to address climate change and sea level rise impacts to our transportation infrastructure and work towards um, resiliency. Um, as mentioned before, this effort was funded by OLDCC, um, Office of Local Defense and Community Cooperation. I'm still learning that acronym, Sam, you're not the only one. Um, so as we face increased threats from sea level rise uh, regionally, I think um, grant programs um, such as this one can really help us um, continue to identify and address these challenges um, 
and uh, they can help us also bring additional resources to our region. Uh, so it will be beneficial to continue um, finding these grant opportunities and uh, working collaboratively to go after them. Uh, I'm confident we can successfully um, do so through regional forums such as the military working group um, and make a strong case for our region. Um, another point I wanna make is that the, the great thing that is coming out of this effort is the MIR hub or Military Installation Resiliency Hub that Jeff already talked about. Um, this will allow um, the Navy and the jurisdictions to share information. We have al already shared information. We always do communicate with each other, uh, but what this hub does is allow us to do so efficiently and also on a consistent basis. Um, people move on, you know, from jobs, people retire, and the Mirror Hub will ensure that we will continue to share information and find the right point of contact at the right agency. Um, and lastly, I want to say that the, um, the military installation resiliency, um, this plan is obviously not the final answer here, and there is a lot more work to be done, uh, but this effort has provided us a good foundation um, to partner, uh, to continue our efforts um, for partnership and uh, work towards a, a more resilient Navy and the community. That's all, thank you. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Any other comments, questions? Mr. Artassin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Jeff, nice presentation. You obviously, uh, this is a huge undertaking and appreciate from my perspective hearing about the coordination that's being done with the military, the port, cities of Coronado and Imperial Beach and others that are directly affected by it. Uh, this is, it's a massive undertaking and it's a real critically important undertaking that that you that you're involved with there. I took note of that when you identify projects that you go out to the stakeholders and you try to get input on which ones should be prioritized. Um, th that's to me where you start to face between science and in politics. Um, science, real science and the needs of the respective communities Who makes the ultimate decision on those is it does this percolate up to the board the santag board and they they're the ones that eventually make those decisions on which projects are funded clearly the 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 needs outweigh um the the ability to pay for all this stuff at this point so you have to be real critical about that right so that's my question really how do you make how do you get that taking all that input in and finally reach a decision point on which ones are going to be funded and which ones are going to have to wait for future years. Great question. Uh, and it, I think it depends on the, the project or the solution that's being identified and proposed uh, for those ha that have, so for, for civil engineering projects or nature-based solutions, it really comes down to the authority having jurisdiction. So whoever has land use authority at the end of the day is the one who needs to implement that and is the one responsible for it. Now, Sandag does have a role in making recommendations um, for some of the sustainable transportation options that have are more programmatic in, 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 in a sense. We have more uh, ability to help push those forward. Um, but for the, 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 the like the, the projects that go into the ground, it needs to really be build a consensus and be built upon the authority having jurisdiction. So whether or not that's on a, a state highway, so that would be FHWA, DOT, or if it's within a local jurisdiction or a community, like Coronado, for example, it'd come down to coordination with Coronado and the DOT. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I should have mentioned is that, you know, the corridors are need to be resilient, but sort of the communities that surround them. And so I had mentioned that these projects need to identify or work with uh, compatible surrounding land uses. And so identifying where the water is coming from is really the, the first step. And so that may be part of working with the port and Coronado, for example, I'm picking on you guys because you had spoken up. So, um, but th that's, it, it really is a challenge because it does, it does require so many different jurisdictions to buy in and build consensus before you can actually implement something. But um, when it comes down to it, it's, it's the authority having jurisdiction for the final say. Good question. Yes, Mr. Galloway. Jeff, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thanks for the report. I'm just curious with this first phase, this latest phase you worked on, who at the city of San Diego did you work with in terms of Ma the Maureen Gardner. Okay. Um, so for this next phase, feel free to reach out to me and I can certainly give you in contact with some different um, uh, additional people because 
this issue kind of crosses many different departments within the city of San yep. Diego. So I want to make sure it's kind of diverse in terms of who you're talking to, or at least have the opportunity to get for the second involved. phase. We've been working with Julia Chase and Maureen mostly for the second phase. Uh, there's been a few other city staff that have been involved in the PDTs and I can follow up with if you'd like, but uh, definitely want to make sure that we're talking to the right people. Great. Yeah. I just said, I also recommend looking at some of our lane use plans because we have addressed sea level rise, like for instance, the Midway Pacific Highway plan more recently did uh, address some of these issues as well. So to the extent that you can already build off of some of those recommendations rather than having to reduplicate them or go sideways from them is always helpful. Absolutely. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Good, good question. <clears throat> Any other comments, questions? Okay. Uh, April, if, if they have questions after today's meeting, who could they contact about any of these projects? Or something? You can contact me and either I'll know the answer or I'll find someone who knows the answer. My That's contact good information answer. is on the next slide here too, so you're welcome to reach out to me as well. I don't know why I won't go to the next one. Okay, thanks. This item is discussion only, uh, no action is needed. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. All right, moving on to item number eight. That is the National City Installation Resiliency Study, phase one. Another award from the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation, or OL. DCC is the National City Installation Resiliency Study. This builds upon the work our military working group started with the military multimodal access strategy. Harbor Drive Multimodal Corridor Study, and Naval Base San Diego Parking and tra Traffic Congestion Relief Plan. We'll now hear an overview of phase one from Tom Bertulis of KTUA Planning and Landscape Architecture, as well as some others. It's all yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and I will mention that I'm here with a colleague from KTUA and two colleagues from Kimley Horn. We're working on a team to That's put good. this together. Uh, do I have control here or? Is it this guy? Start hitting buttons. The big green button. You know, I was doing everything but that button. That's pretty funny. So thank you, everybody. This is my first time presenting in front of this group today. So, um, and that was nice that we just had Jeff present on a resiliency project because this is also funded by the OLDCC. It's a resiliency planning grant. Uh, it's City of National City got the grant, but in partnership with Navy Base San Diego and the projects or the potential projects are both in the City of National City and in San Diego. So the purpose, and I'm not gonna read every single word because you're gonna be bored to death, but is to encourage coordination and collaboration between the City of National City, the Navy Base and other agencies. So this is the ideal group for this coordination and input. For, and, and Steve had already mentioned this in the beginning, but solutions related to traffic, transportation, and parking. So the needs, and this is pretty critical, the needs are establish a policy committee to make final recommendations to the National City City Council for approval. And we've, we've done that. We're having a series of policy committee meetings. And critically for this group, utilize SANDAG's military working group as an advisory committee. And I understand that uh, Sandex Military Working Group is from all around the county, so maybe not everyone's, I, I happen to live in North County, but maybe not everyone in different parts of the county is interested in City of San Diego and National City. But if any members are interested in this potential projects from this study area, um, that would hopefully be an action item. Please let us know, maybe reach out to April or reach out to me and hopefully some of you can give input on this. And then the last line, coordinate and collaborate as needed with other public agencies to build consensus as much as possible on these issues that I mentioned. So the phasing, this is pretty straightforward, existing conditions that we're wrapping up. Uh, future conditions that we're just delving into now includes traffic analysis, mostly synchro uh, traffic analysis and design drawings. And then we'll develop the, the final plan. Notably, it's wrapping up in July, which is pretty fast. So if you are gonna give me input, um, let's do it ASAP because it's, you know, we're, we're not really used to moving at this pace in this field, but this is good news. So the study area here you can see in green is National City west of National City Boulevard. And then going up into parts of San Diego, there's a couple of trolley stations there around 28th and 32nd, you can see there. 
And you can see on the right side, you know, we're going to review past and present planning efforts. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel to create a baseline condition in the form of a summary report with the traffic model. So these will look familiar to many people in this room. There's been a lot of work been out there in planning in this area. I mean, dozens of, of efforts. And so what we did is we reviewed all these previous efforts and we're actually not developing projects. We're using existing projects that haven't gone to final design. Maybe they've been identified and then we're collating all those. And then we're using groups such as yourselves to help prioritize and rank those. I know there was a question earlier, how do you, who makes a decision? But so how do we prioritize and rank? So this will be, there'll be one slide at the very end that's critical for everyone to digest and absorb and then hopefully give us feedback. So where is congestion happening? You know, I can tell you where congestion is happening where I live. I'm sure anyone who's been here um, at any point, you, you get a pretty good sense, you know, in this case, in the darker red, you get have more uh, traffic congestion, and we are trying to mitigate congestion with these projects. Let's see if I get to the next slide. Collisions are not as apparent as congestion. This map is from 2011, 2021, the 11 years of most recent data that we have, and it shows collisions. It's a little hard to read. It shows fatals, uh, severe injuries, um, other injuries we left out, fender benders, because that would cover the whole map. <laughs> and you can see here the big arrows point to the fatalities. There's you know, three in the upper right-hand corner. Um, three more kind of the left, so maybe six in 11 years. So on average, a fatality every other year, just to kind of give you an idea, but we are looking to mitigate collisions as well. Here it is. How do you prioritize and rank projects? Here's where you come in. Now, I don't expect you to read every line here because it's small, a bit fuzzy, but this, if you're interested and you reach out to April and or myself, we can look at the work we've done, We've come up with criteria, you know, kind of intuitive. The more collisions, the higher it gets ranked. The more congestion, the higher it gets ranked. Also proximity to Navy gates. Um, if it's a straw net corridor, it's gonna be higher, high importance. Connection to the freeway, connection to the trolley station gets more importance. But we are interested in your opinion, your input, what should rise to the top, what's not as important. So this is it. Um, you know, what are the next steps? Well, we're gonna analyze future conditions uh, with Synchro. If it's, you know, if, if it's a roundabout project, maybe we'll use something like Sidra. Um, draft recommendations in AutoCAD. Basically, we'd like to put these on a silver platter to go chase grants. So we'd, we wanna have 30% design drawings. We use those to chase grants. That's why we go out um, to this working group. That's where we're gonna go out to the public pretty soon. And we have this policy committee and ultimately we'll come up with a final report. So these potential projects, what are they gonna look like? Uh, not too different than the terminology that Jeff used just before this, but level one will be, will develop these conceptual projects, probably about the 30% level evaluating feasibility and just rough order of magnitude costs. Level two aren't quite as detailed. Um, they'll be conceptual, but we're not gonna go in detail with the feasibility and we'll include them in our outreach. And finally, level three, we'll just develop a list of considerations for future development. So there'll be three levels of projects. And we do want input on where the potential projects could go in these three levels. And that's it. Any questions? Okay, thanks, Tom. Do you have any presentations from your, your colleagues or are you, are you all together all in one? In We're all in one. They're here for the Q&A, yeah. Oh, okay. So you're ready for just about anything. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I saw the I don't know. Before. I don't know if I'm ready for uh, everything, but we'll see. I left that wide open. Okay. Before we get to member questions or comments, uh, Tess, do we have any things from the public? There are no public comments. Well, this is just an easy meeting so far in that regard. So uh, you're off the hook in a lot of ways there. Uh, I, any questions or comments from members of the group? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So first and foremost, I've been stationed here a couple times. And as you know, Coast Guard Sector San Diego is right across the street from the airport. We only have one point of entry and exit from the facility. And the footprint of our facility is extremely small. So anything that impacts us is gonna impact North Harbor Drive and airport traffic. Thank you for the protected green arrow so we can access our base. It's 
made a huge positive impact. However, I do have a concern when I'm, um, something that's been pretty on the front of my mind, uh, if we have like an active shooter or civil disturbance, we don't really have a good way as far as an alternate secondary point of entry or exit from our facility, but also managing traffic flow. And it's going to, anything that impacts us is going to impact the airport, which is a big deal. Um, staging of response assets across the street, maybe in the cell phone lot once it's complete. So just trying to come up with good solutions for any type of exigent circumstance like that to where it's not going to impact the airport, it's not gonna impact the port as badly as it possibly could if we did not have a plan in place for anything that maybe affects the um, integrity of our facility. Excellent question. Yeah, no, I mean, I, as someone who flies in and out of the airport quite a bit, I would like to see that area easy to access, especially if there's any kind of emergency active shooter situation. Having said that, uh, one thing that's key is um, our study area doesn't quite go that far north. It just is tiny little bottom part of the city of San Diego where 28th Street and 32nd Street is. That's as far north as our study area goes. Um, but you did mention that what impacts you know, Harbor Drive and around the airport does trickle down. Um, so absolutely, you know, we're, if, if you have any specific input on our list of projects that we've developed, or if, you know what, if there's a project on there that's, that we, we forgot about, we're very open to including other projects. Um, so if you have anything specific, you can say, oh, look, project XYZ, could you consider it? Could you uh, do a design drawing for it? We're very open to that. Um, is that answer your question? Yes, thank you, sir. Okay, sure. I think that's an excellent question because that affects every military facility and installation is the ability of its staff to get to base in the case of an emergency and from the base in case of emergency to, to do things. So I, I, I agree with you, Lieutenant, it's not just a Coast Guard issue. It is a issue of every military installation is how do we activate and and uh, ensure that our readiness is not impacted adversely by local traffic conditions. Absolutely. Yes, Ms. Conway. Who is the, um, your client on this? So Old CC is funding it. The, technically the client is the city of National City because they went and chased the grant, um, but because it's a military installation project. We do need to um, interact with the port. We interact with uh, MTS, City of San Diego, any agency that's within the study area, we need to get input. Um, does that make sense? So I saw your study area included the City of San Diego. Are part you of it, yeah, the bottom part of it, correct. Which I understand for traffic purposes why you would expand out there. Are you also going to be making recommendations to right away and mobility related issues within the city of San Diego? Correct. Yeah. And are, are you from San Diego by any chance? Yes, I am. And remind me your name. I'm sorry. It's Tate Galloway, Deputy Director for the Planning Department. Okay. I'd love to connect with you and have you give input. Um, if, if you could, Morgan, make a note of that. Uh, yeah. No, if we could have a conversation and Give, you know, give us all the input you have on city of San Diego um, would be great. The reason I mentioned that is that we just, um, our city council adopted the Barrio Logan community plan update. Okay. And we're ready to go to coastal commission for certification. So we're probably not at a point where we're gonna include any significant changes right now that would require anything that would deal with coastal commission. Mm -hmm. sort of changes so just kind of keeping that in mind that we have really looked at you know analyzing that you know that said certainly open to looking at you know other long-term suggestions and ideas on how to improve access but any sort of major changes we we have already addressed that so i would recommend looking at the community plan update thank you for letting me know yeah i know i i'm Familiar with Barry, Barry Logan, I did not know that they've come so far with this project. Um, what we're doing is we're incorporating projects, existing projects out there, so we don't reinvent the wheel, we don't overlap, and you know. So if something is already in motion, we want to know about it. That's another reason why we should connect. Yeah, thank happy you for to that. put you in touch with the appropriate people who could excellent you could work with. Thank you for yeah. that. Thank you, appreciate it. Question? Yes. I have one comment. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, one thing I want to say is, um, first of all, it's very encouraging to see all the local jurisdictions going after all these OLDCC grants. I think it's a great opportunity to use what we call other people's money to uh, solve our regional problems. Um, in order to be considered for the OLDCC grant, um, the local jurisdictions need to show a military nexus, that it will benefit the military as well as the local community. And I want to say that we are here to offer any support to the local jurisdictions who are thinking about an OLDCC grant. Our uh, community plans and a liaisons officer at the bases are here to support you with that uh, grant uh, application process, providing that nexus, um, providing you information on our mission, the impact so that you are um, better um, suited to, um, you know, apply for those grants. And then also at the region level, we can provide support as well. If there's any information we can provide on, you know, what impacts are certain um, um, projects are having on uh, the Navy, we can provide that information and assist. So thank you. Good information. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question on the OLDCC grants. Would that apply to uh, jurisdictions outside of coastal areas, for instance, if there was a, a large housing development of personnel in uh, Sarah Mesa, and there was an issue for them uh, with transportation getting to their to their assignment on time, would that potentially be a, a, a grant type of the project? Um, my understanding is that, yes, they do qualify. Um, um, you don't have to be a coastal, um, you know, community to apply for the grant. Okay. They generally need to meet uh, quality of life is one factor. Um, resiliency, you know, if it's, uh, let's just talk about water projects or something that the community share. And um, readiness is another one. When we did the fire department, it was under that and resiliency, really. You can, uh, the base, the installation has to endorse your package. And in that endorsement, they need to address how that relates to the installation. But it can be anywhere. And, and that would cover things as, as wide as health and safety of, of its personnel? Sure. I, I think you could do that. Uh, it's it's really how well you word the document mm -hmm. and you word you you uh, have the buy-in of the installation and how that relates to the community. It's a little bit difficult when it gets a little mushy out there. Now, in the priorities uh, that I listed, they are ranked. So if you come in with a quality of life, but resiliency, is another project that's, but they're not competing. I don't think there's anything that keeps an installation from endorsing multiple submissions. So. It sounds like it could go two ways. Both the uh, the city could request, is this something that the military would be interested in applying together an OLDCC grant or the military saying to the city, would you join us in this uh, grant opportunity? I, I could see both cor correct. Uh, the, the burden is really on the community to identify, and in some cases, it has to be a funded project. Um, it, now, I'm not familiar with the study. The study is a little bit different, but sure. there is a, I, I guess, what it's called the, um, the matching. And so, yes. and, all, and the DCIP is not large amounts of money. There's a, it, the pot is getting bigger, but it's not, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. that, that I've seen so far. Yeah. Uh, but you never know in the future. Okay. Uh, Ms. Wang, you're from the Naval Base here in San Diego. Hi, good morning. I just wanted to add a little bit to the discussion. So I was going to point out that um, the Navy bases doesn't just mean those three on the coastline. We, we also have housing areas that we have uh, that's in other jurisdictions. As long as you can have that military nexus of how um, it could improve quality of life or um, access for both. And I was also, also wanting to point out, this is one type of grant being put out for OLDCC. This is the Military Installation Resiliency Study. And actually, when we went after this grant in the first place, we actually went after a compatible use study. So that's a different kind of study, but it's from the same folks. 
um, DSIP, as you mentioned before, it's a shovel ready. These are all planning grant. And as far as matching, depending on the size of the city, that does um, have an impact on how much your matching is. For instance, for National City, you just have to do, I believe, a 10% match, and it, staff time could be included in that matching. Good information. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and also, if there's a project you want to go after, I, I think the first step you need to do is contact um, the base that that is being impacted. Like for myself, as Naval Base San Diego. If you're not sure which military base, I would contact Musca, and they will, we will start that dialogue because there is a letter of support needed from our base commanding officer to go after these grants. And as far as MIRs um, and CUPs, they are, um, you can nominate it throughout the year. DSIP, they do have a set deadline in the summer time. Thank you. That's the color of the new bags. No, because this is stu the study doesn't go into that detail as far as environmental, but it depends on what jurisdiction. So this is national city, so they should cover for CEQA instead. If I can just add and clarify, um, for the military installation resiliency, those are the plants, um, you know, they're just studies, so no need for requirement. However, if you are applying for DSIP, you do need to have a, uh, you know, have done your environmental analysis and your project needs to be shovel ready. Good, good sharing of information. Any other questions or comments on this item? <clears throat> okay, thank you for your presentation. Thank, thank you all you for very coming. Much. That takes us to item number nine, the upcoming meetings. The next uh, meeting date we've decided will be September 11th indeed, and uh, December 4th. And we'll have, uh, we'll be in contact with each of you kind of as a post, post-mortem on the meeting. What, what did you want to hear that you didn't hear? What did you think was helpful sharing uh, so that we can really sharpen these things and, and make them even better? Um, I'd like to take a moment just to thank Sandag staff for their work, getting us to this day and all the, a, a great turnout. So I uh, appreciate all the efforts of everybody here. And I think that takes us to adjournment. If, unless there's any final comments, uh, we will consider ourselves 20 minutes early to the finish time. That's always a good thing. Have a good rest of your day. We're adjourned.